Chapter 8. Macro Contact I waken again in 2150 with the wetness of tears still on my face and the sound of Raina's voice saying, He's returning. Opening my eyes, I surprised the look of worry and concern on Carol's face. But, turning my gaze to Raina, I found again the wondrously serene and confident expression that was oddly at variance with the almost electrical excitement or joy that seemed to radiate from her. Now her eyes became even more brilliant as she smiled at me. There, you see, she said, you already discovered that at least your alpha mate isn't perfect. She's demonstrating concern and worry, which are always a reflection of something less than total macro-awareness. I reached over and touched Carol's face as Raina continued. You're learning something of our customs very quickly. It won't be long now before you'll be seeing occasional imperfections in the rest of your Alpha members. Will I ever be able to see them in you? I asked. She laughed and said, You won't see me looking worried or becoming upset over any of the problems you're struggling with right now. However, until I am totally macrocosmically aware, there will always be greater lessons for me to learn. You mean, I said, that there are problems that bother even you? That which is a problem to the child with one year is no longer a problem when that child has had three years, she answered. Yet the three-year-old level has its own problems, most of which are not even perceived by the child of just one year. And so it goes, with level seven problems not apparent to a level three. Be assured, though, that every level has its challenges. Seen as problems, they become increasingly more complex, more difficult. Seen as elected opportunities for growth, they're a joy to solve, to deal with effectively, to grow from in this game of life. But it eventually all ends when one attains total macro-awareness, I asked. She laughed. Total macro-awareness is the experience of all problems, all sorrows, all frustrations, all pain, all ignorance, all ugliness, all disease, and all their negatives in all times and in all places. Now that's hell to anyone who isn't completely macro. But from a state of absolute macro-awareness, it's completely balanced by all the positive qualities that ever were or ever will be. And that's perfection, which is the opposite of a frustrating, dull, and fruitless micro-existence. All right, I said, I'll take your word for it. How can I, at my very limited micro level, learn to grow as fast as possible? We learn by doing, by taking risks, by failing, and only then by succeeding, she said. We grow from our mistakes and from our failures. If we cannot see that failure is the essential other half of success, then we try to avoid failure, and in so doing, we avoid success. Then I guess I should get as deeply involved with everything and everyone as I possibly can, which means taking lots of risks and having lots of failures, I shuddered. Sounds pretty frightening. There really is only one fear, she said, and that is the fear of failure, which is the same thing as feeling inadequate to do whatever you want to do. But you must look to your unlimited self for help, Carol said. Then you can see the larger perspective in which failure and success are one. Considering this, I responded thoughtfully. To turn to my unlimited self, by 1976 definitions, would mean to turn to God. That would mean prayer, which I never could get into. It's no wonder, John. Prayer, as consciously used in your time, was actually an intense pleading for something that the person actually felt he didn't deserve to have or was afraid he would not get. Since our predominant thoughts materialize to become our reality, people usually don't get what they consciously pray for because their predominant thought is that they don't and won't have it. From another point of view, however, every thought we think is a prayer, since once thought, it is a permanent part of the universe and addresses the macrocosmic whole. All prayer, Rena continued, indeed all thought, expresses desire for something. We'll call it prayer or call it thought. It's all the same, and it's the tool with which we create all that we experience. Since your mind is an indivisible part of all mind, your desires are all-powerful. You will receive whatever you desire and believe you will receive. However, if you desire to run away from the light, from macro-awareness, into the darkness of amnesia, which is micro-awareness, then you will receive that request also. So you see, John, prayer, as seen from a broader perspective, works. Prayers are constantly and unfailingly answered. We just don't always like the answer. In other words, I said, since our minds are all-powerful, our problem is to learn how to use them positively rather than negatively. 
Not quite, John, Rena answered. You can't have positive without negative any more than you can have up without down or success without failure. Thus, the problem is to learn to use our minds with perfect balance, that is, with total acceptance of everything, both success and failure, knowing that every failure leads to success. And how do you do that? I ask. Every lesson to be learned, Rena explained, requires mistakes or failures. This varies with each person in terms of his past learning and all his incarnations and excarnations and multidimensional experiences. Seeing my puzzle expression, she added, This is because no experience is ever forgotten by the soul mind or subconscious mind. It's all cumulative. Thus, if for one child it takes 10,000 failures to learn to walk, the sooner he makes those failures, the sooner he learns to walk. Since Microman does not understand this cumulative effect, he becomes easily discouraged and often thinks he is as far, or even further, from solving the problem after 9,999 failures as he was at the end of 10. But of course this is not true, Carol injected, because at the end of 9,999 failures he has only one more to go to have complete insight and success. But I thought you said that every failure is a success, I queried. Yet you mentioned 9,999 failures and not the 9,999 successes. How come? Because, replied Raina, Microman is not worried by successes, only by failures. Since he's not aware of the cumulative effect, he doesn't realize that every failure is a necessary and successful step toward complete insight. In other words, each failure is a small insight success, bringing one that much closer to total insight success. Hmm, I'll think about that, I said. But how do I specifically go about learning or developing my macro powers? Rena answered, you don't start out by developing macro powers. You start out to develop macro awareness. The powers develop as the macro awareness increases. However, Carol added, you need to remember that there are two necessary factors in all learning, sufficient desire and sufficient belief. One example, Rena said, is when a person desires to learn to swim, but does not believe he can learn to swim without drowning. He obviously will not learn to swim as he lacks the necessary belief. Or the opposite, Carol continued, when he believes he could successfully learn to swim but would rather play tennis. Now he lacks the necessary desire and again will not learn to swim. Thus, Rena added, with both sufficient desire and sufficient belief, anything is possible. Hmm, that seems simple enough, I said. They both laughed, and Raina said, It is simple, John. Because you grew, you expanded your perspective, took a broader point of view. The universe and its functions are all very basic and incredibly simple. It's man's limited perspective that makes him look complicated. But it's in the doing that one learns, not just in the talking about it. So why don't you go back to your alpha and desire growth and accept all that you experience as an opportunity chosen for that growth? She smiled gently as she added, when one has already successfully transcended 174 years and acquired a new body, it should be difficult indeed to doubt anything, least of all future successes. During the next few minutes before we left, Carol and Raina talked of incomprehensible things while my mind was feverishly occupied with trying to understand all that Raina had said. Carol touched my shoulder, and we all walked to the door in silence. As we reached the threshold, I took Raina's hand and touched her face gently in appreciation. Then we left with the memory of Raina's electric eyes stirring something very deep within my mind. As we returned to our Alpha, I asked Carol why Raina chose to appear middle-aged, since I assumed she had the mind power to make her body into any form. Carol replied that when she had asked Raina the same question, the answer she had received was but one word. Variety. Back in our Alpha room, Carol explained that while the evening hours were devoted to macro-tutoring, the last hour before sleep was devoted to macro contact. She explained this as a letting go of all micro identity and experiencing the awareness of total macrocosmic oneness. After a relaxing bath, we lay naked on our bed, and Carol asked CI to provide macro contact stimuli. The video screen was immediately filled with an ever expanding and ever evolving geometric pattern. The room was filled with soothing resonant sounds that seemed to cause my whole mind and body to resonate in similarly evolving and enlarging patterns. At first I was leery and tried to resist the strange sensations caused by the incredible visual and audible stimuli. 
But Carol kept murmuring, desire and believe, experience and accept, let go and let's grow. Finally, I gave up all resistance and found myself flowing on a gentle river of multiple sensations until I seemed to enter an infinite ocean of unspeakable unity, oneness, and balance, accompanied by the most soul-satisfying feeling of harmony imaginable. When I returned to what I thought was my normal limited awareness, I heard Carol saying that it was morning, and that I had experienced my first macro contact. I turned to look at her beautiful naked form beside me and realized that her eyes were closed and that she was lying quietly as if still asleep. I wondered if she had really spoken, and suddenly, without moving her lips, I heard her voice saying, Good morning, John. You're experiencing your new macro power of telepathy. My God, I said aloud, I must be dreaming. A merry peal of laughter came from a carol who was obviously very much awake and suddenly rolling happily about in my arms. You're not dreaming, she said with her lips this time pressed against mine. You're just beginning to experience your macro powers. Now push the top button so we can experience the morning light. I started to rise, but she refused to release me, saying, Do it with your mind, John, not your body. How? I wondered. The answer came, Reach out with an imaginary finger and touch the button. I did this, and the light came pouring in on us. There, you see, Carol glowed, your first demonstration of psychokinesis. Now push it again. I did, and once again the room was in darkness. It's true, I said, pushing the button again to let the morning light back in. I can do it, but how? Did you ever experience macro contact before? Carol asked rhetorically. Then, well, that's what happened. You'll never be so limited again. You mean that because I was able to let go of my micro identity last night, I can now experience the beginning of macro power? Yes, Carol replied. While everyone experiences macro contact, the micro person, suffering from self imposed isolation from the rest of the macrocosm, does not consciously remember these experiences and thus cannot profit much from them. You have chosen to remember your oneness, and thus your macro contact. To the extent that you remember your contact with your macro origin, you will have macro awareness and all the powers that go with it. I feel like a giant, I said, and covered her with kisses that soon led to complete joining of our bodies. Then I heard Carol's voice ask C.I. to again provide our individual soul notes, the same notes that had resonated through our room last night as we prepared for our macro contact once again filled our room. What was that you asked for? Our individual soul notes? I inquired as they faded away at the sound of my voice. Yes, she responded. Each soul has a unique vibration. Yours and Leah's are exactly the same. Mine's very similar to yours. That's one of the reasons I was selected to be your first alpha mate. See, I knows each person's soul note or vibration, and by playing both of ours together can help us attain complete immersion in each other and our oneness with all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. Is that the same as macro contact? No, was her answer. Macro contact is achieved through total merging of minds, not just bodies. Sex used with a macro motive can help us attain macro immersion, merged with each other, or macro contact, merging with a macrocosm. Use it with a micro motive, and you have all the micro divisions and misery that micro sex can cause. Then sex is neither micro or macro? I asked. It depends on your motive, Carol answered. Sex is a part of the natural rhythm of the macrocosm, like everything else. It has many very positive functions for people of all ages. Used to relax, to relieve tension, to express love, or just for fun, it enriches life. Used to control, coerce, abuse, or used against the wishes of either participant, it results in negative vibrations, which can be extremely hard to balance. Whether sex, like any other thought or act, is more macro than micro is determined by one's motivation in that time and space. Then Carol asked C.I. to supply macro stimuli. Our room was once again filled with the exciting residences. This time, one glorious note was repeated over and over in an evolving pattern until my body and mind vibrated as one in exquisite joy that kept mounting in intensity until again I experienced myself as a mighty river. This time, however, I experienced the river as being two great rivers that had united to make one. While we did not join the infinite ocean, I find that I still have great difficulty selecting words to describe this accelerating experience. When our rivers crested into one huge, tumultuous wave, I held her tightly and moaned ecstatically as Carol cried out. 
the sound of our soul notes gently receded in volume and intensity until the room was at last silent once more as we they peacefully joined together i began to realize that i would never again desire less than macrosexual union i heard carol say in my mind that i would probably now limit myself to only those whose soul vibration was almost or totally identical to mine all other unions would be hollow imitations of the real thing but how many females would that include i asked out of all the people in the macro society approximately a thousand could achieve macro contact with you here in our delta which has five thousand females there is leah one of your twin souls whose vibrations are identical to your own myself seven other females and two males whose sonolts are similar enough to attain macro contact with you two men my mind boggled at the prospect of what i would should do in this 2150 culture if i met a man who made me feel the way carol and leah did of course john you know that we can incarnate as either male or female that doesn't change your soul vibration ci carefully determines its alpha mate recommendations on the basis of soul note similarity the final decision is then left to the parties involved you'll know a soul mate or a twin soul by the harmonious vibrations however it's only with your twin souls that you can experience perfect harmonic balance at all times do you have a twin soul here i queried carol smiled and said don't worry you aren't depriving me of a twin soul in fact it's extremely rare that twin souls incarnate at the same time and place they usually decide they can learn faster in this dimension when they're separate it tends to spur them on to greater learning efforts so they can reunite sooner i wondered why leah my own twin soul had brought me to her own time and space and whether perhaps what carol had said didn't apply to us of course it applies to you she responded you came together because your learning could be accelerated faster this way than any other way you've met her and know that you cannot become her alpha mate until you finish your macro society education to completely sever your mind-body connection with 1976 you must demonstrate third level awareness and you must do this within three months of your 1976 time three months that's impossible well we hope not carol responded but you'll have to work very hard and it must be completed within the three-month time period why i demanded and why didn't somebody tell me this before the answer to your second question carol replied is that you would have thought it completely impossible before your first macro contact the answer to why only three months is that it takes a great deal of energy on leah's part and not only to bring you here but to keep you here last night was the first rest she's gotten during your stay here as long as you were in macro contact you were free of all time-space restrictions and therefore needed no help to maintain your time-space translation you mean that if i can ever demonstrate third level awareness that i can help her keep me here that's right and c i has calculated that leah can transcend the time-space barriers without your help for three months my god what an assignment well, what if i can't make third level in three months what happens then i asked you return to your time period for the rest of your present incarnation leah will have used up her present incarnation's life energies possible without becoming discarnate dead as would be the case if she tried to continue transcending time space barriers by herself or if she tried to re-establish contact later but couldn't some of the other level nines or even tens help her i asked they are helping her carol replied every level nine and ten who is incarnate on this planet or any of our neighboring planets is helping and are quite a few discarnates too however no one but a twin soul can supply the final link energy and as long as you are incarnate this is limited you've got three months in which to demonstrate third level awareness that's all i'm glad i didn't find out about this sooner i said while my initial response was outrage at the impossibility of the task before me i realized that after what happened this morning nothing's impossible well now you know why we brought you here carol said we feel that nothing is impossible she glanced at her mib and said that we had fifteen minutes translating from metric time before joining the rest of our alpha for breakfast we bathed and dressed and were in our alpha dining room just as the rest of our alpha was beginning to eat they looked up as we entered without speaking said welcome john to the macro powers as we ate breakfast i asked carol how the others had known about my macro powers demonstration she suggested that i ask him but before i could voice this question i found eight pairs of eyes looking at me and a message ringing in my mind we're all in telepathic contact and now you've really joined us 
then they assured me that they would do all in their power in helping me prepare to demonstrate level three awareness within three months we talked about ways in which my awareness could grow and be accelerated by increasing the number and frequency of learning experiences this led to a discussion of how the normal seventh triad experiences could be broadened to include more opportunities for experiencing macro contacts alan explained some of the requirements for transcending the micro world he began by saying that since the two factors in all learning desire and belief are developed by cumulative failure success experiences obviously the more of these i could have the faster i would learn however the problem with macro contact for beginning students was that the experience is so pleasant that it tended to make them want to hold on to it in order to escape unpleasant micro experiences this would immediately end the upper level contacts because they are made possible through joyous pursuit of learning experiences and their consequences not by retreating from them they all admitted their own macro contacts had been extremely limited since this ultimate experience requires total acceptance of everything which obviously not only includes all the positive experiences but all the negative ones as well at this point carol said that our recent macro contact was only the fifth time in her life that she had attained this level although she had attempted it every day since she first entered the second triad at age of three Alan said that while he had demonstrated six-level awareness and attained macro contact more times than anyone else in our alpha this was only ten times the problem was desire not belief since they had all experienced macro contact at least once they no longer doubted it was possible however their desire tended to be limited and selective rather than the necessary all accepting paradoxically then the more often one attained macro contact the more difficult the next contact became the less one's awareness, the more one tends to grab, to cling, to attempt the impossible feat of holding on to, holding constant, a part of the macrocosm. Sometimes takes a tremendous number of little failures to lead to one great success. Well, then, I said, if it takes a thousand failure successes to reach level three awareness, I currently have only five hundred, and the solution is to experience five hundred more failure successes and fast. Exactly, she said but a thousand degrees of failure success which means that one huge failure success may equal a hundred small ones that gives me a fighting chance i don't think i'll have time for five hundred little failures in three months but i can keep hoping until the very end for one monumental failure that will completely fill my quota they laughed and told me their sense of humor was always a sign of expanded awareness then alan said that they usually spent their mornings at the ci center or in their rooms using ci as a learning machine the afternoons were spent playing learning games with the other triads, and the evenings were spent with their personal evolution tutors. This daily schedule, I learned, was not inflexible, but broadly applied to all triad levels. The older triads, however, particularly the 8th, ninth, and 10th, spent more time with the younger triads, especially the 1st and 2nd. They felt the early years were crucial ones, for they contained the greatest number of critical learning experiences or developmental lessons. Steve used the analogy that the taller the building, the stronger its foundation has to be. Thus, once the foundation is laid, the maximum limits for a building's size are established by the strength of its foundation. Joyce continued, pointing out that micro-souls chose macro-families to be born into and receive early micro-learning experiences, which severely limit the rest of their lives' learnings. Thus, there is literally no hope for micro-man from a micro-view only the macro view which includes joyous acceptance of total responsibility for all that exists within our lives offers ultimate success and hope after breakfast carol suggested that we walk to the ci center where we could obtain separate rooms in order to work on separate problems as we left our gamma i noticed that again the weather was beautiful and remembered that ci had told me that it was controlled i began wondering when it rained or snowed and realized that i knew very little about our geographic location for that matter, the New World Geography of 2150. There were just so many questions to ask and so many things to learn. I envied Carol, having grown up in the Macro Society and having used CI for so many years. We arrived at the CI Center, and I went again to the room overlooking the lake, while Carol chose an adjoining room. For the next four hours, I forgot everything else in my enthusiastic questioning of CI over as broad an area as possible. I began with geography and discovered that one of the reasons the world maps of 2150 had changed so greatly was the shifting of the poles. According to CI, Microman's interference with the ecological and geological balance of the world 
had caused such tremendous chain reaction pressure buildups that great land masses had sunken into the oceans and vast areas previously below the water had risen. As a consequence, the north and south poles had shifted, producing vast climatic changes. Delta 927, in which I was living, was located in what was formerly northern Canada, and the climate was semi-tropical, although controlled temperature limits were between 60 degrees Fahrenheit at night and a maximum of 80 during the day. Leah had been right when she said that I would not recognize the world map of 2150. Every continent was drastically changed, and there were two new continents, or subcontinents, as large as Australia, in the North Atlantic and the South Pacific Oceans. Since all of these great Earth changes had taken place by the early part of the 21st century, I could understand how the Earth's population had shrunk so drastically to only a little over 300 million by 2150. As a social psychologist, however, the bulk of my questions were in social areas. I was fascinated that there were no businesses as I knew them in 1976. Since the macro society valued expanded mental awareness so highly, the vast array of material artifacts, such as several hundred different brands of soap, toilet paper, toothpaste, or pet foods, were non-existent. Concerning the latter, I'll digress just enough to mention that there were no pets, since macro man lives in harmony with all animals, and thus keeps none of them in domestic bondage for food protection or friendship. Without a wastefully polluting, competitive economy, there was no need for salesmen or advertisements, and since all factories were run by servo mechanisms, there were no worker-manager divisions, and thus no labor unions. Because there were no laws requiring litigation, there were no lawyers, no courts of law. Because there were no illnesses that could not be controlled by the macro-mind powers, there were no doctors and no hospitals. Because there was universal agreement in the macro society on the values of love and cooperation, there were no vast governmental bureaucracies. The thought of no government was incomprehensible until I realized the governmental functions of the micro-society would obviously not be needed in the macro-society. There were no police or armed forces because there were no micro-divisions or inequities. There was no money or private property because all physical needs were provided free. There were no taxes because everyone owned everything and contributed everything to fulfill the means. No need for welfare agencies to take care of the victims of micro-competition or indifference. No need for legislatures or legislators with their endless micro-biases and acrimonious debates. No need for lobbies to protect the vested interests of big business and labor. No need for politicians, the CIA, or the FBI. No need for micro-bureaucracies at all. When I thought of a world of competing religions and my own USA of 1976, professing Christianity but practicing micro-separation, I remembered the tens of thousands of church buildings constructed at immense cost, with their tens of thousands of church officials attempting to help microman attain salvation and social acceptability through membership in some narrow religious sect. The world of 2150 had no churches, and no priests, ministers, or rabbis. Could there really be a time when there would be no religious fanatics or separatists? No groups of people claiming to be the chosen people of God? seems that microdivisions had low survival value, particularly in religions, which were so important to man's beliefs or philosophy of life. Only an all-accepting philosophy of macrocosmic oneness had long-term survival value. I knew Carl would be fascinated by C.I.'s description of the end of racial indifferences. By 2150, drastic physical changes in the earth had caused drastic weather changes, which caused drastic economic changes, which caused drastic social and spiritual changes. The final result was an almost total blending of the races, with the added benefit of greater mental and physical health, strength, and beauty. There were no longer any racial divisions because there were no extreme differences in any physical characteristic, including skin color. Macroman was a combination of the best genetic qualities of all the races, which left only one race, Macroman. I was not really surprised that a modified type of English was the only universal language of the macro society, since even in 1976 English was spoken as either a first or second language among a majority of formally educated people throughout the world. The macro society had its origins in predominantly English-speaking North America in the latter part of the 20th century. Then, of course, a majority of the people surviving the global catastrophes of the late 20s and early 21st centuries spoke at least some English if only as a second language. 
There are two reasons why the macro society movement succeeded. It attracted highly evolved souls who had macro potential, and micro man who refused to cooperate became almost extinct. While the early macro society did not refuse membership to persons who used tobacco or alcohol or even drugs, no one who consciously attained even one macro contact and thus at least some macro awareness ever desired them again. Thus, only level ones who had never experienced macro contact ever felt the need of chemical stimulants or depressants. The goal was to free yourself from all physical dependencies. However, no one above level two in the macro society ever condemned any micro dependency or attempted to convert others to accepting a macro philosophy. They were interested in quality of membership, not quantity. I thought of all the utopian societies that had been envisioned and how they had all failed and wondered again at the amazing success of the macro society. It was here that C.I. had reminded me that there is a time for everything, even macro man. According to the macro society, the souls of men are evolving back to total macro awareness. At the micro level of evolution, a society based on love and cooperation is impossible. Finally, enough souls evolved to macro potential so that the macro society was possible. For those souls, still at the micro level of evolution, there were other Earth-type planets in the physical universe as well as other dimensions in the non-physical universe. The great problems for macro man were no longer the physical universe, but existed in the various dimensions of the non-physical universe. While C.I. gave me a great deal of information on these other dimensions, I found most of it beyond my comprehension, so I went on to questions about my own personal plight. Decided to ask C.I. how to attain level 3 in three months, but discovered that I had finally found an area in which C.I. did not know the answer. It was discouraging to find that no one had ever expanded their awareness from level 1 to level 3 in only three months. However, C.I. insisted that this did not mean it was impossible, for there was an entirely new factor present which had never occurred before, and this new factor was what C.I. called twin-soul time-space translation. According to C.I., the very fact that they had succeeded in bringing my astral body to 2150 and having it incarnate in a specially created physical body indicated my macro potential. In other words, it could not have happened if I had not been sufficiently evolved along the microcosmic-macrocosmic evolutionary continuum. Furthermore, since Leah was my twin soul and had demonstrated level 9 awareness, it was thought highly probable that I could soon develop at least level 3 awareness. The problem was the length of time it might take me. See, I could find no way to extend my three-month time limit. However, since I was linked to Leah, and she was linked to the mind powers of all other level 9s and 10s, this was calculated as a tremendous advantage for intensifying both my desire and my belief in macro contact. Then there was the fact that I had attained my first macro contact so swiftly. Because of this, CI indicated that the probability of swift level 3 attainment was greatly increased and suggested that I make another effort at macro contact as soon as possible. I thought that over for a while and then asked if CI was suggesting that I make the attempt immediately. The answer was affirmative. It was at this point that Carol entered. I didn't have to tell Carol about C.I.'s suggestion since she had telepathically picked up my thought and come to help me. She sat down beside me and immediately indicated her willingness to join me in my attempt at macro contact. I asked C.I. to provide the macro stimulation and again began experiencing the hypnotic line and color patterns on the video screen along with the incredibly exciting, yet paradoxically relaxing tones that seemed to penetrate and expand every cell of my body, every level of my mind. I soon found myself flowing as a mighty river with the powerful feeling of peace, joy, and contentment. Suddenly the river lost power, washed back on itself, and became murky. The tones grew ever more distant as the backwash seemed to carry me away from them. I broke out in a cold sweat of fear, frantically grabbing for the tones. The more anxious I became, the faster they disappeared. Somewhere in the back of my mind came an ancient Confucian definition of love, something about two fish in a pond. The pond went dry. Through joining together, the two fish made it over the vast desert to another pond. Arriving there, they let go of each other and went their separate ways. It was said that their ability to let go was love. Now, why had I thought of that? What did it have to do with my present state? Was the letting go a kind of acceptance of what is as perfect, that fine level 10 trait? 
Was my own anxiety for the experience driving it away? I was losing ground so fast I had little left to lose, so I bit all my chips on acceptance, commanding my body, mind, and emotions to stop struggling, to relax, and to appreciate the absolute perfection of all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. Some cubbyhole of my mind was amused at the paradox and laughed at me for having the audacity to think I could keep anything by frantically hanging on. Laughter relaxed me. I stopped resisting the backwash and began to appreciate its power and beauty. It whirled me around then, lifting me up to the top of its crest, hurled me forward. The river was clear, sparkling, and powerful. Was it? Had it always been that way? Was my mind playing tricks on me? Was its change actually within my own mind, a product of my own anxiety? More laughter overflowed the corners of my mind. I had always loved philosophic puzzles, and this one was a beaut. Yielding myself totally to the e-mental, that's a 2150 contraction of emotional and mental, movement, I flowed joyously on and on through what seemed an endless series of dimensions. Finally, I reached the infinite ocean and experienced the unspeakable joy of macro contact. When at last my eyes opened again, Carol was smiling radiantly. You attained macro contact a second time, John, in less than a day, she beamed. But I have a feeling, I said, that I almost didn't make it. Then I realized that Carol had not succeeded. I was deeply touched by her happiness for me. Things happen in their own time, John. We have to learn to understand and accept that. You can't push the river. Come on, I'm starved. Exacting two tiny tablets from her mib, she handed one to me. What's this? I inquired. That's our lunch. Our what? I asked incredulously. Carol had gone to the wall and come back with two transparent, seemingly weightless cups of water. It's magic. If you swallow it and drink the whole cup of water, I promise you won't be hungry again until this evening. Whereupon she downed her pill and the water. I followed her example and in moments experienced the satisfied well-being of having just finished a complete meal. What's more, Carol told me that it contained a balance of all the necessary food values that my body would require for six hours. When I asked her why they bothered with developing solid foods such as the delicious seaweed steak I enjoyed so much, she said that they enjoyed the taste of food when they were with their alphas, but used the food tabs when they were busy with other activities. Speaking of other activities, she said, it's time you visited the other triads. We left the library research building and walked leisurely in a pleasantly warm early afternoon sun. We left the path and walked in the shade of the stately trees toward the student recreation area. As I breathed the fresh, sweet air and felt the luxuriant green life about me, I thought how incredibly fortunate I was to have the opportunity to experience such beauty, tranquility, and joy. Carol used her mib to talk with Alan concerning the recreation area we would visit first. This reminded me of a question. What do you use your MIB to talk to others for when you have telepathic powers? She laughed. With my limited telepathic powers, about all I can do is send or receive very general messages. Unless a person is close, my power is not clear enough to maintain integrity throughout transmission. Do you mean it's like tuning in a television or radio channel? I asked. No, it's a good analogy. The quality of your reception depends on how powerful the sender and how sensitive the receiver. She paused, then said, Actually, only ninth and tenth levels can communicate with each other totally telepathically. How about the other macro powers like clairvoyance, precognition, retrocognition, and PK? I asked. As a rule, she answered, the macro powers are somewhat limited at the lower levels of awareness. In fact, even third and fourth levels demonstrate far more excellence in the first three macro attributes of love, leadership, and wisdom than the seven macro powers. So you have to wait then, I said until attaining ninth or tenth level of awareness before demonstrating complete adequacy with macro powers? That's right. Now you can understand why I didn't try to teleport those water cups we used earlier. The cups alone I could have managed without too much effort, but fill them with water, and I would have had to work really hard to keep from spilling them. It would have taken a long time, and it would have left me tired. I didn't realize it would tire you, I said, surprised. See, you've already begun to learn that true power lies simply in knowing, acceptance, desire, and belief. When we first begin using macro powers, we almost without exception think it will go more effectively if we try harder. 
This almost irresistible urge to try takes a lot of energy. You mean, then, I said, that it's just a matter of practice? She smiled and said, yes, that and a mental discipline. Our problem is that our lives are so happy and peaceful that we lack the necessary desire to practice very often. Hmm, I said. Maybe that's true for you who have grown up in the macro society and have forever to attain your goal, but I've got only three months to attain mine or return to the 20th century for the rest of my life. Exactly, Carol replied. And that's why the level nines and tens are willing to try bringing you here, because you would have more to lose and thus greater motivation than anyone in the macro society ever had. Okay, I said. I'm ready to start practicing. Where do I begin? Great. That's what I've been waiting for. You had to ask. We could not force you to start practicing. She threw her arms around me and planned quick kisses about my face. Well, well, I teased. I'll bet even old B.F. Skinner of operant conditioning fame would approve of your behavioral conditioning techniques. I don't know about Skinner, but I'm glad you feel rewarded, she said. Now let's get to work and practice some PK. See if you can teleport this pebble at my feet. I looked at the pebble she was pointing at and decided that since it was very small, it should be an easy place to start. I reached out with imaginary fingers to pick it up. It didn't budge. You're trying too hard, Carol suggested. Relax your mind by remembering your macro contact experience. After a couple of minutes of recalling how I almost lost macro contact, I stopped trying. To the best of my ability, I found my mind blissfully serene. I gently reached out for the pebble and easily raised it to eye level. Then I made it dance and weave through the air about us. For the next few minutes, I experienced the strange joy of successfully using PK. I probably would have gone on to larger objects if I hadn't become aware of a rapidly increasing weariness that seemed to be creeping through my body. I dropped the pebble. Carol smiled wistfully. Now you know what I meant about becoming tired. Since you have so recently experienced macro contact, you can probably counteract the fatigue by again recalling the experience. Give it a try. I decided that I was just too tired to stand up any longer, so I lay down in the soft, sweet-smelling grass and tried to follow Carol's suggestion. My fatigue seemed to interfere, and it was several moments before a strong memory of free-flowing, accepting macro contact succeeded in restoring much of my vitality. I slowly got to my feet. All right, I said. I've learned my lesson. Don't overdo practicing macro powers. Carol looked at me for a minute, then said, How do you feel? Now that most of your energy is restored, would you like to practice some more? No, I answered. I really think I'd better wait until later. It was then that I realized that the memory of my macro contact had been so pleasant and soothing that I no longer had any desire to practice my macro powers. That's right, Carol said, obviously practicing her telepathy. The memory of macro contact can restore your energy, but it can also leave you so pleasantly satiated that any desire to put forth the effort necessary for macro practice is greatly diminished. My God, I exclaimed, that's what you meant when you all said that the more macro contacts you had, the less desire you had for growth to change. Yes, that's right, but this is only true at the lower macro levels. Once you reach level 9, it hardly applies and by level 10, you're completely free of any micro-desire to avoid the failure-success patterns of all growth and learning. I forced myself to try moving the pebble again and began bouncing it along ahead of us as we continued our walking. Carol took my hand and kissed it lightly. See? They were right. You do have more desire than anyone else. Then she laughed and said, You're such a good influence on me that I'll help you practice. Then you won't tire so soon. With these words, she began taking turns with me at bouncing the pebble along before us. For the next few minutes, we continued this very relaxed type of simple PK usage, and while I felt some weariness begin to return, it wasn't so awesomely powerful as before. We ended our PK practice as we topped a slight rise and walked through an opening in a large broad-leafed hedge. There before us was the first triad playground, which I realized later was about a quarter of a mile directly behind our gamma building. The huge playground was the 200 yards square and closed by the stream that surrounded it. The stream was punctuated by waterfalls and ponds with broad expanses of sand about them. An array of children's exercise devices, some of which resembled what I knew as jungle gyms, dotted the playground, making me wish I was about one-fourth my size so I could enjoy the thrill of the pipe slide 
or of going hand over hand from one end to the other of the fifty-foot horizontal ladder. Carol surprised me by saying that such playgrounds do exist for adults in every gamma location, emphasizing the fun and importance of adult physical play. There were balls, blocks of various sizes, and other toys and learning devices that I had never seen before. While there were about a hundred children between the ages of six weeks and three years, I was surprised to see that the adults seemed to outnumber the children almost two to one. Sensing my surprise, Carol reminded me that everyone in the first four triads had older brothers and sisters assigned to them from the other triads. In the third and fourth triads, alpha mates shared the same brother and sister who were usually alpha mates themselves. However, in the first and second triads, each child had five elder brothers and sisters of his own assigned to him from only the eighth, ninth, and tenth triads, along with some other older, non-student volunteers. As we walked about the playground, I was reminded that even back in the mid-twentieth century, psychologists know that for maximum mental and physical growth, children need far more than just adequate nutrition. However, in the twentieth century, one out of three children was permanently damaged by poor nutrition alone. Beyond food, though, were the three psychological requirements, loving acceptance, verbal stimulation with intelligent older children and adults, and opportunities for unrestricted exploration. These last two were frequently summarized as richly varied mental and physical stimuli. Yes, I thought, the knowledge for macro growth had been available in the 20th century, but micro man neither desired nor believed in its development. Even psychologists and psychiatrists were often unable to provide loving acceptance to their very own children. This was largely due to their unquestioning acceptance of the limited micro theory that we as adults are the pawns of our early experiences. I smiled as I recalled the standing comment at our universities that anyone who got a Ph.D. had to really hate himself to put up with all that crap. It was certainly true that a person could get a Ph.D. and still know practically nothing about how to actually live a healthy, balanced life. What's more, with a Ph.D., he could avoid practicing therapeutic mental health concepts by spending the rest of his life teaching them to others. I remembered another famous line that said, Those who can do, do. Those who can't, teach. After twenty-some years of formal micro-education, I was inclined to believe that there was some truth in this saying. While wandering about the play area, I had received telepathic messages of welcome from all the older brothers and sisters. I was surprised at the intelligence and physical dexterity of these youngsters of the first triad. It's hard to believe, I said, that none of these children is even three years old. Yes, Carol nodded. We have proved that with adequate nutrition, plus generous amounts of the three psychological requirements that you were just thinking about, both mental and physical growth can increase many times faster than microman ever supposed possible. But now let's go on to the second triad learning area, she suggested. We walked through another opening in the densely growing hedge that surrounded the first triad learning area and walked about a hundred yards through a park until we came to another seemingly impenetrable hedge. Finding an opening, we entered the second triad area, which I discovered was at least twice as large as the first triad learning area had been. Again, I was struck by the wide variety of learning devices scattered about this huge recreation area. Of course, the devices were generally much more complicated and included construction materials for making miniature gamma complexes, complete with materials for constructing extremely complex dolls. The jungle gym type of climbing and swinging apparatus was more extensive and covered with small children swinging with the agility of monkeys through a maze of bars reaching over 50 feet into the air. With an area fully 300 yards square, there was no crowding for the 100 second triad students and 200 of their older brothers and sisters. This time, as we wandered about, I was surprised to find myself frequently greeted telepathically not only by the older students, but also the younger ones. I turned to Carol and asked her about this. How is it that so many children are demonstrating telepathy, I inquired, feeling somewhat retarded as compared to these gifted children. During the past ten years, the macro society has attracted no soul who did not demonstrate at least second-level awareness by the end of the third triad. Wow, I thought. That meant that their nine-year-olds, without exception, had all demonstrated a greater level of awareness than I had. When did you demonstrate third-level awareness? I asked Carol. Not until the end of my fifth triad, she answered. Then, smiling impishly, she added, Don't worry. I'm sure that having used my alphamate will increase my rate of learning, and I should demonstrate fourth level very soon. Does anyone remain at second level for their whole life? I asked. 
Actually, she replied, we haven't had anyone less than a third level by the time they had completed the tenth triad for over fifty years. This means that you are attracting more highly evolved souls, I said. When she nodded in agreement, I pointed to several groups of children who were obviously participating in highly competitive sports, both individually and in groups. I don't understand, I said. I thought the macro society was opposed to competitive activities. We're only opposed to competition when it's destructive to the welfare of others. But isn't losing in games destructive to their self-concept, I asked. Not at all, she answered. In fact, it's absolutely necessary to learn how to accept failure successes in order to attain a macro self-concept. However, she continued, the kind of macro competition that plundered and polluted your 20th century, allowing only a few to live in luxury while the majority of the Earth's population suffered a scarcity of essentials, is destructive competition. It's the kind of selfish micro-behavior that destroyed your society and stimulated the desire for a better one, the macro-society. I studied the responses of the older triad students to the winners of the games. I finally decided that both winners and losers were accepted equally in terms of being loved, but that winners did receive positive psychological reinforcement. We recognize, Carol continued, that life would be deadly dull if we avoided all successes for fear of failures. That's only a problem for Microman, not the macro society. While I was thinking over what Carol had just said, we walked over to a large swimming pool. I immediately noticed that all the children in the pool seemed to be excellent swimmers. I commented on this. All of the first triad children, Carol explained, learn to swim by the age of two. By the time they're in the second triad, everyone is almost as at home in the water as on land. Of course, everyone swims at least once a day all year round, so we get lots of practice. And we learn by practicing, I added. Speaking of practice, what other macro powers can I start working on? Well, now that you've asked, Carol replied, I think this might be a good time to start developing your macro vision, clairvoyance. Look at the children and tell me if you can see the auric colors that surround their little naked bodies. I peered about, checking my perceptions. I don't think so, I told her, but maybe I don't know what to look for. Well, you probably can't see the human aura without a tunic to reflect and magnify it, Carol answered. And it's probably because you lack the necessary predisposing belief. Let me tell you something about it. First of all, she began, the aura is produced by the electrical emanations of the human soul, which are clairvoyantly seen as colors. We can tell by examining a person's auric colors what his level of awareness and emotional balance is at any given time. For example, if anyone gets caught in a micro-perspective, his auric colors tend to run together and become muddled. Then if he becomes angry, his aura gets very red. If he gets jealous, it becomes a sickly, greenish-yellow which is similar to the auric color of a person who is deliberately lying for selfish purposes. Since you obviously can see auras, how about describing mine, I suggested. All right, John, she replied. Your aura extends about 12 inches from your body. This distance will increase as your awareness expands, and is now predominantly a lovely sharp blue-green with some purples, yellows, and greens. When I first met you, before your first macro contact, the colors were not so clear and sharp and there are more gray tones and more orange to pink. You also have the beginnings of a white, which is the dominant color of level tens, reflecting perfect balance. It's interesting to look at me through your eyes, thanks. Now, how can I learn to see auras without the help of a tunic reflecting them for me, I ask. First, try to recall your last macro contact experience, and that will raise your vibrations or awareness level so that you can use what the ancient mystics called the third eye. This is associated with the pineal gland which permits us to see high-level vibrations while still enclosed in our low-vibration physical body. Then, she continued, practice looking around people, not directly at them, and perhaps you'll begin to see the colors emanating about their heads and shoulders. I felt several questions, fighting for expression, but before I could ask them, Carol suggested that I get the details from CI later and devote this time to practice, so I tried recalling my last macro contact. In less than a minute, I felt ready to try seeing auras. I turned toward Carol and tried to look around her instead of at her. At first things seemed a little out of focus, but after adjusting my gaze I found that I could see lovely bright colors shining about her. You're right, I said. I see the colors surrounding your head and shoulders, that they seem to fade in and out. Is that how you see them? No, John, she replied, happy with my apparent success, but after you practice a little more you'll see them more clearly. Well, here I go then, I said. I selected an older student swimming with one of the young ones, and tried to focus on his aura. I was able to bring in most of his auric colors pretty well. 
Then, switching my view to the child, I described his aura to see if I was viewing them correctly. You're doing just fine, she said, but right now I want you to try something else. Look about 20 feet directly in front of you and tell me what you see. I changed my gaze and looked intently, but though I felt a warm, happy glow inside, I saw nothing. Well, try some more macro contact recall, she suggested, but keep looking. I tried for about 30 seconds, then suddenly my mind seemed to shift focus, and I became aware of a dazzling white light surrounding the body of a strong and handsome man. I see him, I said excitedly. It's Eli. Why couldn't I see him normally? She laughed at my use of the word normally and answered, because this time he's using his astral body to visit the thousand deltas of his caton. You remember that you occupied only your astral body when you first came here. Then you entered your physical body, which had been prepared for you. Yes, I said, thinking it over, and some of the students couldn't see me until I got into this physical body. Actually, Carol said, only level nines and tens are always clairvoyantly aware, so it's possible for anyone in our alpha to occasionally miss seeing an astral traveler. Well, what's the advantage of traveling around in your astral body, I asked. Well, Carol answered, it's the only way you can travel to any of the non-physical dimensions. But the reason our upper levels use it so much is that it takes considerably less energy than translating the physical body from place to place. Astral travel permits instant translation to a series of places without fatigue. What do you mean, Carol? I don't remember anything instant about my traveling when I first came here. In fact, when Lee and I were running to the research center, I couldn't even catch up with her. Carol laughed. That's because you thought you were occupying a physical body and you were limited by your belief. You didn't think your physical body could run any faster, so it didn't. It's as simple as that. You mean, I asked, that if I realized I was using only my astral body, I could have traveled faster? Huh, faster indeed, was her response. Faster than the speed of light. That is, of course, if you believed it was possible. You see, the astral body has no mass, and thus is not limited by the speed of light. In other words, at the astral level, your mind is not hampered by clumsy, dense physical matter, so a thought manifests its consequences immediately. You just visualize it, and it happens. Level 10s can do the same thing with physical bodies, but it takes more thought energy. I shook my head, and, turning to Carol, exclaimed, That's amazing. I'd really like to learn to do that. Well, we'd better master your telepathy first, Carol responded, as she looked over to where Eli had been standing, and then back at me. I followed her glance to the spot where our Katar had been, but it was no longer there. Where'd he go so fast? To another delta? You need more practice, John, she noted. You missed his greeting to us as well as his statement that he was leaving us to visit with Leah. I felt embarrassed at missing Eli's communication to us. I thought I was doing pretty well, but that certainly put me back in my place. I really wanted to talk to him, too. I guess I need a lot more practice, was my painful conclusion. Another question popped into my mind. Say, you mentioned that he was a Katar. I was wondering, are all your leaders level 10s? The top ones, yes, our three mutars, who are leaders of 100 million member mutons, and the 30 katars, who are leaders of 10 million member katons, are all level 10s. The rest of our current 127 level 10s are zetars. That means, I interrupted, recalling my CI training, that they are leaders of your million member zetons, right? To her nod of agreement, I added, and since you have 300 of these, I suppose the other zetars are level 9s. That's right, she nodded, and since we have currently 3,306 level 9s, all of the 3,000 ATAR positions as leaders of 100,000 are filled by 9s. Then I suppose it logically follows that the deltars are either the few 9s who are not ATARs or all 8s. Yes, she said, since there are some 39,000 level 8s, we have more than enough to fill the remaining 30,000 deltar positions and the rest of our gamma leaders. But since there are 300,000 gamma positions, I surmised, the rest must be filled by level 7s. I paused for a moment to let a nagging thought come to the surface of my mind. Okay, I went on. Maybe you can tell me what was the youngest age that anyone ever demonstrated 9 or 10 level awareness. I'll have to ask CI, Carol responded, and began talking into her mib. After a couple of moments, she said, the youngest age to reach level 10 was 39 and the average age of all level 10s at this time is 107. As for level 9s, the youngest ever to demonstrate level 9 awareness had had 33 years, and the average age of all level 9s at this time is 93. 
The youngest age of attaining level 8 awareness was 27, and their average age is 77. That means, I said, that if I make level 3 in 3 months, I'll be doing all right. Not bad for a beginner, John, not bad, she teased. And then, I'm glad to see you optimistic, because it certainly won't be possible unless you first believe you can do it. Well, we'd better get over to the third and fourth triads now, so you can meet your younger brother and sister, Carol added. Will I be taking someone else's place? I mean, don't they already have an older brother? I asked. He's already gone, Carol assured me. He was my previous alpha mate, but he's gone to another delta to complete an alpha there. I realized that I hadn't asked Carol about her previous alpha mate before, because I had felt guilty about the possibility of displacing someone. Then, when I got to know Carol better, I felt little stirrings of jealousy, and I thought about someone else preceding me as her mate. Now I checked my mind carefully and found few remnants of either guilt or jealousy, so I asked her if she didn't miss him. Not really, she replied. You see, we share almost identical soul notes, so I can reach out to him telepathically any time I wish. I'm happy to know that he is as pleased with his new alpha mate as I am with you. But I thought your telepathy was very limited, I said, puzzled at her apparent ability to reach out clear to another delta. Well, you'll find, John, that it's ever so much easier to communicate telepathically with those whose soul notes are close to your own. Take Steve, for example. His soul note is very different from mine, so I would have to work hard to receive from him, even as far as across the lake. However, the closer the soul note vibration, the easier it is to communicate, and the greater the distance your message can carry to that person. That sounds reasonable, I responded, then added, tell me. How did there happen to be an opening in another Alpha just when I arrived? Did somebody die? Oh, no, she assured me. There haven't been any deaths in the seventh triad for over three years. However, frequently someone will volunteer to work on Micro Island for a few months. That will often leave an Alpha either one or two short. What kind of work do they volunteer for out there? Well, we offer our services as personal evolution tutors, she replied. Some of their children, as well as a few adults, seek our services. Well, if those on Micro Island are similar to Micro Man of the 20th century, I said, don't you run some risks visiting there? Yes, we do, she admitted. At least those of us who have not yet reached our higher level of awareness do. You see, it's no problem for level 9 or 10 to cope with an attacker, a robber, or an assassin, since their precognitive and telepathic powers would warn them and their PK would teleport anyone who bothered them clear to the other side of the island in the blink of an eye. That's some way to handle a nuisance, I laughed. Do they attack their tutors very often? Oh, yes, Carol replied. Anyone who kills a member of the Macro Society automatically becomes something of a hero to a great many of the inhabitants of Micro Island. Well, how do you handle that? I asked. How do you punish them? And why do they want to kill you in the first place? Well, to answer your last question first, they hate us for living so differently from them, she replied. As for punishing them, of course we don't. We're careful, therefore, to let only those who have attained at least second-level awareness visit Micro Island, and even they are protected by telepathic communication with a level 9 or 10. You said that it had been three years since anyone died in the Seventh Triad. Was that last death here or on Micro Island, I asked. On Micro Island, she responded. It does happen occasionally, but more often than not, it happens to the older students who ask not to be protected. Good God, I exclaimed. Why would they do that? For the same reason the great macro-philosopher, Tudor, Jesus, permitted himself to be crucified. To show micro-man that the soul of man transcends his body, was her explanation. I shook my head. I can never see that bit about getting killed or crucified just to show others you aren't afraid of death. Well, I think there's more to it than that, Carol said. For right now, we'd better give our attention to finding your younger brother and sister. As we walked the short distance to the recreation learning area of triads three and four, I wondered about the necessity of assigning older students to supply the caring relationship with the special brother and sister to the younger child. Carol picked up my thoughts. Probably isn't as important now, since we would provide this relationship even if it weren't assigned. But when the macro society began, there were not so many highly evolved souls who could telepathically tune into the needs of others. So, in order not to miss anyone, elder brothers and sisters were assigned to all students. Then, as our personal evolution tutoring system developed, Elder brothers and sisters were assigned only to the first four triads. Speaking of tutoring, I said, how does it work? What's the difference between that and teaching? First of all, Carol replied, we here in 2150 do not believe in the ancient concept of teaching where students passively absorb or blocked out what a teacher was desperately trying to give them. 
we therefore have no teachers we believe learning to be an active process where one person reaches out and takes knowledge stimulated by his interaction with a resource person so you feel knowledge can only be taken not given i summarized yes now to answer your question resource persons are specialists in learning areas such as agriculture ecology or biophysics for example while personal evolution tutors deal with all learning and all human problems it sounds like you think resource persons know all about something and your P.E. tutors know all about everything. Do you really believe that's possible? Carol was amused by my skepticism. It depends on what you mean by know all about everything. To the extent that our tutors have attained moments of total macro-contact awareness, they do know everything. But knowing the answers to all questions and living these answers are two different things. Even a macro person cannot live a perfectly balanced macro life, she said. We just haven't evolved to a state of constant macro-awareness yet. When we reach that state of evolution, we will have outgrown our need for a physical body, even a macro one. All right, I said. What you're saying, then, is that you have tutors who can supply all the answers, but that the real problem is not finding the answers, but putting the answers into practice in your daily life, living them. A same age-old problem. I went on. If you only have 127 level 10s, and 3,306 level 9s, and since they serve as your leaders, this must leave you with a real shortage of tutors. Oh no, Carol assured me, there's no shortage, because all persons in level 6 and above function as PE tutors. This includes 30 million 6s and 3 million 7s, as well as 3,908s. I did some quick mental arithmetic. That makes 33,003,900 tutors so there are less than 10 pupils per tutor. Still, if everyone saw a personal evolution tutor every day, there would be no time for all the level 6s, 7s, and 8s to do anything but tutor. And that doesn't sound like much of a lie. Don't they get tired of it all? Well, I can see where that would be an awfully tiresome existence, she answered. Fortunately, it's not that bad at all. You see, only students see a tutor every day, and even that isn't required. The vast majority of our macro society doesn't visit with a P.E. tutor more than once a week. As she finished speaking, we entered the thousand-square-yard recreation learning area of the third and fourth triads. I was impressed by the tremendous activity going on as far as I could see. There were at least 30 tennis courts, three football and soccer fields, and all kinds of gym equipment. There were also tracks and swimming pools, with meets in progress in each area. I turned to Carol and commented, it seems to me that there are a lot more triads out there than just the third and fourth. That's because the fifth and seventh triads are assigned to the third, and the sixth is assigned to the fourth, she explained. Oh, that's right, the older brother-sister system. But why are two triads assigned to the third? Do they need extra attention for some reason? Actually, Carol answered, it's the first two triads that get most of the attention. We use the third and fourth triads for the 5th and 6th and 7th triads to practice developing their skill at maintaining a helping relationship with someone younger. It seems that helping someone is the most highly honored achievement in the macro society, I observed. Carol nodded, saying, That's why our PE tutors occupy our most respected social positions and provide our top leadership. In the 20th century, I said, we valued the entertainment professions more than any other, I guess, for we gave our most valuable rewards, money and fame, to entertainers like movie or television celebrities or sports stars. That's because Microman's life was so miserable that he uses any sort of entertainment to escape, Carol explains, so naturally entertainers would be paid more than anyone else. You know, I reflected, that doesn't say much for the value we place on education, does it? Teaching was one of our lowest paid professions. That's true, John. Microman placed very little importance on education. Your schools, therefore, were often filled with inadequately prepared teachers who were expected to teach their students how to memorize facts in detail instead of how to think creatively. Much time was spent on subjects which were of little use to the average person, such as foreign languages, algebra, and higher mathematics, while most learning programs gave little or no attention to the most important subject of all, human behavior and life philosophy. I grouped these two together because man's behavior is always the result of his beliefs, that is, his philosophy of life. As she completed this observation, a boy and girl ran up and wrapped their arms around her. They looked strong and healthy. 
Unlike all other Macro Society children, they possessed great physical beauty. I was thinking that they must have had about ten years when I received Carol's telepathic message that they were both just seven. She telepathically teased me about having already begun to think in 2150 terms, then introduced me as her new alpha mate, and therefore their new brother. As their eyes reached out to me, I realized another reason why members of the Macro Society greet each other silently. They are using this silence to concentrate on the delightful nuances of telepathic contact, which removes all possibility of fear or distrust. I learned that the boy's name was Neil and the girl's name was Jean. But most importantly, I learned that I felt joyously happy at our meeting, almost as if they were my long-lost friends. I wasn't surprised when Carol explained this, saying that I knew them in other lifetimes in which we were very close. Jean demonstrated her awareness when she picked up the fact that tennis had been one of my favorite sports before losing my leg. She suggested that we play a game of doubles with Carol and Neil standing her and me. This sounds like a fine idea, except that I had never played tennis with children before and was a little afraid that my style might be too rough for them. Accepting the responsibility of the big brother, I said that sounded delightful, and we all headed for the nearest vacant court to select rackets from the rack nearby. As we began playing, I avoided using my power shots, but after the first five minutes of some of the hardest and best played tennis I had ever experienced, I was convinced that Carol and the children were far better at this game than I was. Then I realized that the children were using PK, which is why they seldom missed a shot. If I was going to be of any help to Jean as a tennis partner, I was going to have to get to work with my PK too. Thirty minutes later, I was convinced that the children's PK was far better than mine. They still seemed as fresh as when the game began. I decided to ask for a rest and as we sat in the shade of a nearby oak tree, I invited the children to play tennis with me again soon, since it looked like I needed lots of practice. They both agreed. Neil gave me a happy grin and said, we found tennis develops our desire to practice our macro powers, especially PK. We were afraid at first that you had not yet developed your PK ability and that we weren't being fair with you, Jean added. We don't use PK when we play tennis with anyone who has not developed it yet. I laughed as I replied, I was afraid I'd be too good for you, but by using your PK, you made it the most challenging game of my life. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to practice not only my tennis, but also my PK. Carol hopped up and said, I'm going to take a swim, John, but why don't you stay here and rest so you'll feel like running back to our alpha in time for the macro dance? Thanks, I said. I'll need the rest. That dance is as tiring as playing PK tennis. By the time Carol and the children reached the nearest pool, my eyes were closed. 